teaching series. Uh, we are very pleased today to have Ron Albert from the Kennedy School joining us, and Jim Hernan from Howard from the School will be introducing him. But just a few words before they start. Um, we are very interested in getting feedback from people about this series and how it might have the potential to be extended uh, next academic year, thanks to our friends from Hope, or from San here. Um, and so we want to leave a little bit of time at the end to, to, to talk about how these ideas might be extended uh, in, 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 the, in the future. And I think one of the things that I've learned is do it in the fall when uh, people are a little stressed out then the spring semester and everybody's got theses and other kinds of things that are sitting on their desks and in addition to wrapping up teaching. So that's a lesson that I, I, I take from this. But um, I'm very happy to see you all here. And I should also say that we have a special guest over here, Tanya Deloriziaga, <laughs> from the Harvard News Office, who's going to be doing a story on talking about teaching for the Gazette. And uh, so she's going to be sitting here and watching, but she also may uh, uh, talk to some of you afterwards. One of the themes that we really want to get across is both what we got out of it, and obviously being honest, but also that we have all schools represented here, and that that's something that uh, is a very special feature of this, where we've got people from across the university thinking about how teaching approaches that are tried in different schools might play out on uh, their own purpose. So with that, I will So good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm Jim Honan, a faculty member of both the Graduate School of Education and the Kennedy School, and I am the fourth member of this planning team with Todd and Willis and Lee and myself. And we're just incredibly grateful to, to Judy and Lisa and others from the provost's office who last year gave us support to sort of organize something, and this year invited us back to do this again. And your being here uh, during a very busy time means an awful lot to us about why talking about teaching at Harvard matters. And really, really nice to be part of this. So I uh, thank you. I've been teach. I don't know what you would say, teaching in the other slots, so I missed some of the prior sessions, but I was also talking about teaching during those times. <laughs> so we're really pleased in this fourth and final session to go into a domain that I think is really important for all of us in various professions and domains. And this is substantively this issue of, uh, I guess, two questions. Uh, the title, uh, can leadership be taught? And if yes, how one might go, how might one go about that? And uh, we're really pleased and privileged that our colleague from the Harvard Kennedy School, Ron Heifetz, is with us. Uh, for the past many years, this has been the focal point of his teaching and research, and you have a couple of pieces that describe some of this work here. Uh, he also brings really unique perspectives, both as a teacher and a professional, because he's also a trained physician and a world-class cellist, and so brings other ways of teaching and learning that I think uniquely reside in one person. So we're so <laughs> just delighted that you've taken the time. He's going to talk some about his work and I think model some of this teaching and then has been our protocol. We'll spend a little time toward the end saying how might we incorporate some of those lessons in our teaching. So Ron Heifetz, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. It's generous. Um, well, this is a, uh, a, a really really wonderful opportunity for me. Um, and uh, before I begin, I haven't had the pleasure to uh, meet most of you. So, uh, and of course, a name and where you're from or what you teach is not an adequate introduction, but it would give me a little bit of some idea of, of uh, and you may know each other from previous seminars, but if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves around the room, it would be really helpful to me. So. Stuff. Yeah, I'm Christoph Wolverine. I'm a preceptor in the life sciences and teach a course called Life Sciences 1A. Introductory uh, chemistry and biology from freshman. I've been sitting on 1B a little bit. <laughs> um, I'm Tamara Brenner. I'm from Life Sciences Education and I teach a course called Life and Physical Sciences A, LPSA, and it's also an introductory chemistry and biology class, primarily mm -hmm. freshman. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm Rose Goldman. And at the medical school and Harvard School of Public Health, and I teach at the School of Public Health an introduction to environmental health class. Mm -hmm. And I'm Wendy Jacobs, I'm at the law school, and I teach the practice of environmental law. Well, I'm Eleanor Duckworth at the School of Education. I, 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 I like to think about the question of how people learn things and what anyone can do to help. 
I'm John Macromber. I'm in the finance group at the business school. I teach courses about sustainability in cities. Jim Honan, in my other role, I teach nonprofit financial management at the Graduate School of Education at the Kennedy School. Lisa Periakalo, Provost Office. Judy Singer. <laughs> Judy Singer, Graduate School of Education. I teach statistics. Suzanne Cooper from Kennedy School. I teach economics. Dan Levy from the Kennedy School, and I teach uh, statistics and quantitative metrics. Uh, with the Simmons for the Business School, sort of two hats. I direct the Christensen Center for Teaching and Learning, and I do some executive teaching on strategy and international. <coughs> Todd Rakoff at the Law School, and I teach contracts and administrative law. I'm Beth Gallandarian from the dental school. I teach patient doctor one uh, in the med school, and I am actually the director of a leadership course with Anjali Skoulas. Um, she says hi. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> at the dental school. Yeah. Uh, Brooke Pulitzer, I work with Sam at the Harvard Initiative for Learning and Teaching, and we are trying to catalyze innovative teaching around the university. I'm Mark Mulligan. I'm the program director of the Master in Architecture degree at the Graduate School of Design. I teach courses in architecture technology. And I'm going to go out and I'll in here and say I'm an avid chamber music player on violin. We're always looking for cellists. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, was, was maybe world class. I would never would have said that. Nobody else, well, one guy said that once. <laughs> but uh, that was uh, 30 years ago or more, so uh, pretty rusty. Although. For my 60th birthday, uh, um, uh, my wife to be, she bought me a cello lesson, so I started taking lessons. <laughs> I'm retooling. Great. I'm at the Edge of Gullis, I'm also the design school, two doors down from uh, Mark, and I teach courses on technology and project management. I'm uh, John Pina, at the School of Education, I teach uh, education policy, and I teach a course on research design called. How to ask an interesting question and get a defensible answer. <laughs> I'm Nate Harvison. I'm a preceptor in computer science and I teach CS50 with David Malin. I'm Sam Moulton. I used to be in the psychology department and now I'm part of the HILT team. Really nice to, uh, to meet all of you. Uh, and <clears throat> the breadth is extraordinary. I have to begin by saying I don't know what the application of any of my uh, tinkering and experimentation in the classroom would have to your different contexts. Uh, let me just take a few minutes to describe the various teaching methods and the, the context that led to the generation of these teaching methods. Um, and then uh, perhaps I can demonstrate one of them. Um, and then we could open up a discussion about potential applications. But, uh, so, When I came to the Kennedy School in 1983, uh, the uh, assumption was that leadership cannot be taught and that it was uh, an innate set of characteristics. However, the purpose of the Kennedy School, the mission statement, was to prepare people for leadership in public affairs and society. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I think, no, and it was, it was, I think it was completely honest, but I think what it meant was that uh, the inputs, the admissions office would input people who had the leadership stuff. We would teach them lots of things about thinking better about public policy. And the output would be that they would be better leaders in public policy. Um, uh, so the idea that perhaps they were, that it was a very difficult challenge to be unloading on the admissions office because the selection for people who would practice leadership is not an easy prediction to make particularly across different contexts of practice. And second, there may be practices of leadership that can indeed be taught, uh, even if you can't turn any single input into a Winston Churchill, you still might be able to take a lot of varying inputs and, and bring them further along, along some path within some context in which they'd be able to practice leadership. And because leadership is a practice, practiced in different contexts somewhat differently. The, the variety of people that can serve as inputs into some generic set of uh, processes to learn practice might then generate uh, more skill and more capacity that could then be applied given their, uh, some of their uh, already constitutional capacities that could be applied in a variety of contexts. 
So that was the assumption. And we started off in 1983 uh, on an experimental basis. And I uh, was hired for a year on a sort of, uh, who's this crazy guy who thinks he can do it. And so, um, and Graham Allison, who was a wonderfully entrepreneurial and a bit of a crazy dean, wonderful dean, um, said, okay, let's give it a try. Um, and at this moment in time, if I were to, if we were to be at this moment in history, I doubt that I could have been hired to run those experiments. But the school was younger and I think more entrepreneurial. And uh, so we gave it a try and the odds are it wasn't going to work. I said to Graham, nobody knows if leadership can be taught. This is an experiment. Let's just run the experiment for a year and see. Um, we don't really know if it's succeeding or not, even though it's been going on for 29 years. And we've done a variety of tests to try to assess uh, outcome studies of various kinds to assess, is it making a difference? And uh, a, a, a really well-designed study to determine that, um, as Jim said, I started off in medicine. So I think in terms of, are you doing harm and do you better study you know, this new intervention? Uh, and the studies we've done to do a really good study would be exceedingly expensive. I do believe such a design could be done, um, but we've had uh, two studies so far. Uh, one of them is an early study that uh, you saw that was published back in 1988 or 89. Um, it was an outcome study of, uh, of a sample of 300 people and 160 or so people responded. Um, which was a pretty good sample, but nevertheless, it's a self-report survey, and it's very hard to know exactly what that means. Um, more, uh, about a decade later, the Lilly Endowment hired uh, a person who had been a professor at the School of Divinity, um, and also was half-time at the business school, to do a study of uh, my courses and uh, she spent, Sharon Park spent three years sitting in on the course, interviewing students before and after, interviewing a sample of students 10 years later, and then uh, and sitting in all the TA sessions and all the small groups. I mean, she did for three years and gave me feedback. I mean, I learned and the course improved with her feedback. And that study was finally published about five years ago in this book, which uh, you have a sample chapter from. When this book arrived at my house several years ago, five or six years ago, my daughter was about 15, and she saw this book, and there's a sort of an abstract picture of me on the front, and she looked at me, and she said, wow, Daddy, you could die now. <laughs> she said, no, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> there are two current studies going on, one from a graduate student at MIT, the Sloan School, and one a graduate student in the Ed School who are trying to use a, uh, a test. One of them is a Bob Keegan's you know, assessment where they do a sort of a cognitive development assessment. And, uh, um, and they did a pilot of this last semester before and after, very much encouraged by Dan and Levy, who, uh, who then uh, encouraged other people to explore this. And, and they're going to do a full rollout of that study this current coming fall. And that should be interesting. You know, there's a course or a sequence of courses move people's capacity to engage complexity, cognitive complexity, um, along some scale of adult development. Um, all right, so the Kennedy School is a particular um, context. There are a lot of highly ambitious people who have very high aspirations for making a difference in the world. And, uh, and they're operating in many, many different cultures, political systems, um, and organizational settings. Uh, and so uh, having a, such a heterogeneous group of people in a classroom, many of whom are in mid-career, about two-thirds or 60% of my students are people in mid-career. They've had a lot of experience already. Um, is a particular context. And the challenge has been to come up with a theory that is sufficiently generic that can apply across contexts, but not so generic that it's kind of empty and, and, and gives you no traction. And uh, the, second, uh, the second property of the development of these teaching methods is that 
Um, when I began teaching, I was a young doctor and musician, and I was 32 years old, and many of the students were a lot older than I was, and, had a, and they all, almost all of them had a lot more experience than I had. So the courses were designed from the beginning to draw on experience, and they were then highly experiential. And they were experiential in, in at least three different ways. Uh, we used the classroom itself as a case in point, which that chapter you know, is sort of a verbatim, bit edited transcript of one of those sessions. Um, I think it was the first session. Uh, and the point of that is, the theory behind that is that the students will manifest in the group dynamics and in the role dynamics and the conflict dynamics and the learning dynamics, as well as in the authority dynamics between me and them, they will exhibit many of the common organizational dynamics uh, that take place in groups and organizations um, generically in many different settings around the world. That was the hypothesis. Uh, and based on that hypothesis, uh, the class from the very beginning was introduced and framed that we were going to be using ourselves um, as subjects. We we're all going to be um, uh, objects of analysis, including me. And that anybody was welcome at any moment in time to stop the action, press the pause button, and step back on the sort of the balcony and look down on the dance floor of action or the playing field and ask, What's, what just happened in here? What's going on? You know, why is it that uh, Tamara made a perfectly sensible comment and everybody ignored it? And 10 minutes later, you know, John makes the almost same content comment and people build on it and John walks away with all the credit. You know, and I'll say, why might that have happened? You know, and I'll say, well, how many of you have ever had that happen where you were rendered invisible, you know, in your contribution? Um, and I'll say, so we could then step back and do what in medicine would be called a differential diagnosis, where we'd step back and say, why might that have happened? And we can explore the diagnostic options. Well, you know, was it uh, the timing of her comment? Was it the framing of it? Was it the emotional spin of the two different people and how that played into the particular culture of that audience? Um, was it uh, the authority that they brought into the room because one had been, um, uh, you know, a general and the other had been a private. And everybody sort of knew beforehand that they came into the class already vested with different credibility because of their background authority. Or was it gender? You know, or race, or et cetera. And, and, and then I'd say, well, what evidence would you look for? Because if that happens to you, you don't want to jump to the most convenient diagnostic uh, um, assumption, because then your action, based on that diagnosis, will probably be the wrong action. You want to entertain different possibilities and then try to look for information to figure out which one might be right. So I'll introduce that method to the class, and, uh, and then pretty quickly it starts to take on a life of its own, and, and in a couple of minutes I'll give an example of how that might happen. But the second teaching method, which was absolutely vital, I think, and um, less notorious in the sense of the reputation of the course, but from my point of view has at least as much, if not more, real leverage from a learning perspective, is that the course is organized around the student's own cases. I don't present any already packaged and formulated cases. Uh, all of the cases are student cases. Now because our population, my population, my classroom, out of 112 people, there'll be you know, 60 or more who have had a lot of experience, the cases get to be pretty interesting and they come from lots of different um, settings. But there are also a lot of students who are young, including you know, a couple of every you know, few years, a college student will wander in and they'll say, gosh, I don't have any experience, but I'll still have them work off of the case. And I'll, and I'll explain to them, no, you have a case. If you didn't already have a very rich experience to draw from, then you would be a lot more flexible than you really are. But you're pretty set in your ways already. And that's because you have, a, you have a, already 18 or 20 years of, of programming that's determined not just by your genetic constitution, but also by 
you know, socialization that's taken place from the day you were born. And those, each day, and each classroom you've been in, and your family that has its own authority dynamics, and role dynamics, and conflict resolution processes, uh, is a model that you've internalized and that you then use as case material when you approach new situations. So take one of those cases. It could be a summer job, or it could be a classroom situation, it could be a family situation, um, it could be an informal uh, situation amongst a friendship group where you saw something bad happening or some problem and you tried to mobilize people to work the problem but failed. And generally I'll have people work a case of failure. Some case in which they faced a challenge in their organization or in a group and felt stymied in their capacity to make progress. And I'll explain to them that I want them to learn from failure uh, because in the practice of leadership, people fail every day. And if you can't face your failure and debrief your failures, even small tactical failures, like, wow, I should have talked with Sally before I talked to Harry, or I should have framed it this way instead of framing it that way. If you can't every day face and debrief your, your mistakes, you can't take corrective action. And then I talk about leadership as an improvisational art in which every day you're having to take action, get back on the balcony of reflection, assess what's happened, and then take the next move, corrective move, and, and as a basis of practice, that capacity, Donald Schoen wrote about it decades ago, to reflect in the midst of action is an obvious idea, but actually is very difficult for people to practice. So, um, so I have the students work on their own cases of failure because I want to desensitize them to failure. And, and for people who are very proud of themselves from, for their career, that's a hard thing to do. Um, there are people have sunken costs in a particular path and continue to, continue to make it worse because they're not able to step back and say, wait a second now, time to reassess where we are and change. So the course is organized around using current experience, the present experience as a case, and past experience, their own past experiences as cases. And the structures for that are both the large classroom itself, which as a large uh, in time, real in time case, is sort of like a mob in a sense, and because it's a large group system, and then in their small groups, where they every week meet eight people uh, for an hour and a half, same group of people every week for an hour and a half, and over a dozen weeks, everybody gets a chance to present their case for an hour and a half and have the group consult to them on their case. And at the same time, they have to write up a questionnaire that changes over the course of the semester. There are gradations of it questionnaire that helps them step back on the balcony and analyze the dynamics, the consult consultation dynamics in that group. How did that group operate to, pre to um, provide a consultation to that fellow student? And in that sense then, they're using the small group dynamics also as a case in point to learn how to learn in real time when nobody's telling you what to learn, but inductively from their own uh, raw experience. The third form of learning is uh, a bit more commonly used. It's structured exercises. And there are a lot of different kind of structured exercises, you know, from giving people a simulation to what I have people do is, uh, is three evenings where they do musical exercises. And I have people come uh, uh, with a, ask them to bring a poem or a paragraph of prose that's meaningful to them. And, uh, and so everybody comes and we have three three-hour evenings where we do a series of exercises that are meant to illustrate certain practices of leadership that are difficult to analyze and talk about in an analytical way and much easier to talk about in an artistic or um, uh, musical way. So for example, I can talk about and I can illustrate the nature of inspiration 
and insights into what produces inspiration. Uh, I can illustrate uh, improvisation as a practice by having somebody come up and not only read their poem, but then have to make up a song without words. You know, ah, and that's pretty frightening for people. <laughs> and um, and I ha and I use the musical exercise to illustrate listening, because it's hard for the audience to see somebody up here. Sometimes I'll spend an hour with one person in the front, having them do it over and over and over again. First the poem, until they connect with their audience in a particular way, <coughs> achieving a particular level of quality of engagement. And then I'll have them make up a song without words, usually based on the theme of the poem. You know, if it was a, a love <coughs> poem, I'll have them sing a love song, and I'll pick somebody in the group to sing that song to. Or if it's a, a heroic poem, I'll have them sing a heroic song. Or if it's a sad poem, you know, about some tragedy, I'll have them do a song of mourning, you know. Uh, some theme that gives them a little more structure to work with. And there's various ways in which I structure it by giving them some basic instructions. Um, but the basic idea is these structured exercises are a powerful vehicle for getting across particular lessons. Um, listening for the audience, listening musically and not just analytically. How do you listen to the song beneath the words? Um, that's important in leadership because frequently, you know, you're in a meeting and what's really on the table isn't really what's on the table. What's on the table explicitly needs to be listened more carefully to because the, the song beneath the words is really what the, you know, what the issues are really about that people are negotiating about or in conflict or in play. And a lot of times that won't be on, you know. So, so these exercises begin to help people get at that. All right, and then of course there are more traditional, you know, a lot of reading and writing a final paper, analyzing their case, and there's moments of lecturing. And there's a lot of moments of discussion. Those are all classical, more classical forms of pedagogy that are very useful for certain things. Okay, so um, the teaching challenge of using student cases. Uh, I want to speak to that a little bit before I illustrate using the class itself as a case. Using student cases is really wonderful. I mean, for me, um, it would have been the blind leading the blind, trying to teach leadership practice to people from around the world, thinking I knew something about it, um, that would apply to them. But if we're working their cases, then uh, can we, can I, and can the class come up with new diagnostic options or new action options? And I tell them that's our goal. You know, if we can just give this person new ways of seeing their situation. So that if they have um, some new diagnostic options or some new action options, that would really be a great result to our consultation. And we can't know, you know, is that right or not, because in an hour and a half, we don't have enough data to, to test it out. And frequently the case presenter won't have enough data either because some of the diagnostic options are based on questions that the case presenter never asked even though they weren't living the case because they didn't know to ask some of those questions. Okay, so, so the, the, the blessing for me at teaching the, at the Kennedy School, in which so many people already have a lot of rich experience, is that they've been pitching to me now each year all of these cases. And it's forced me each day in front of the students to come up with some piece of theory, some principle that might apply to various cases. And over the years then, a practical theory of leadership evolved, which took me about 10 years to write up in my first book and has continued to evolve since. Um, but the theory evolved because I, uh, because I wasn't teaching freshmen in college, because I was teaching a lot of professionals who were very um, sophisticated consumers. You know, if I couldn't come up with an idea that interested them, that gave them an option that they were excited about, the odds were that I was irrelevant to that. Um, and, and that also enabled me to test out lots of different readings uh, for which readings uh, had traction and which didn't uh, to their own practical needs. 
But the challenge to teaching, from a teaching point of view, the challenge to teaching based on the student cases is I never know what they're going to throw at me. I have a lot less control than a classical case, you know, Harvard Business School or Kennedy School case method class. Because there aren't teaching notes, I haven't had a chance to digest the case, I haven't had a chance to figure out what lesson is to be learned from this case. And what that has meant is, first of all, I have to be able to I have to be willing to learn and flounder in public. Now because I use the class as a case, it gives me permission to flounder in public and then to say, what can you learn from an authority figure and what happens to his or her credibility when he flounders in public? And that turns out to be important because what happens if you're the authority and everybody's expecting you to be a clean machine, but you can't be that day because in fact you don't know what to do. How do, you, how do you renegotiate the social contract so you have permission to flounder in public? Or to, or, re, or to recoup the lost trust, the lost credibility, because you've made a mistake in public and now you've got to figure out how to dig yourself out of that hole. And, and so, you know, the course, because it's framed to use everything that happens, including my mistakes, as case material, I have the permission then to flounder in public, which I have to do because a good half of the cases that get presented, we don't have a big breakthrough. You know, after an hour and 20 minutes, we come up with some new possibilities, but sometimes it's just frustrating. And, and then what the lesson is, can you stay with the frustration and not jump to a ready solution, but stay in that diagnostic process even though the diagnostic confusion is very is, is, is hard to sit with, particularly if you have authority and you're supposed to provide um, answers quickly. So the case material itself, because the students nominated, has a much likely, like much higher likelihood of applying to their lives than a case that I've nominated because I can control it and because it meets my lesson plan. If it's their own cases, the odds are, and what we, I think we found, is they're going to nominate a case that is, that is at their frontier of what they're ready to learn. What's at their learning horizon, as Sharon would have described it. And because it's a heterogeneous group of people, each of them really has a different learning horizon. I may think, here's the 30 ideas I want you to learn, but for some people, you know, lesson two is particularly salient. For other people, lesson 14. So if they nominate cases, then I can respond to their cases and go with them where their cases take me in embellishing and elaborating on that particular piece of content. The challenge, though, is I have to know my own theory so well that I can draw forth whatever part of it is going to apply to their case material. And in some of our areas of teaching, that's more difficult than in other areas. In some areas where you're teaching, you know, you, you've really, you know, you've mastered your theory, but if you're teaching certain arts of practice, um, there's sometimes not even very good theory. So, and you may not have a very organized framework to work. You just may have a series of case materials, each of which is an interesting sample of a slice of life from which there's an important lesson. But how they all fit together into a sort of a coherent diagnostic and action framework, you know, isn't very, isn't yet developed. So how to apply it to anything that gets thrown at you is more of a challenge. So um, those are the two. Th those are two of the forms of teaching. So using the class as a case. Um, so frequently, I will teach by raising questions, and then a discussion will ensue. And after a certain period of time the students will begin to you know, want me to reorganize the conversation or reach closure. And frequently I won't. 
<laughs> and sometimes I'll even sit down. Curious whether we're more or less obedient than your <laughs> classes at Harvard. It's <laughs> <laughs> a statement of fact, it wasn't a question. <laughs> so I, I've done this in, in my class also in uh, kind of large lecture classes, just kind of starting a discussion, which didn't really happen here, but uh, starting a discussion and then just sitting down in the front row. And it really changes the dynamics. People talk to each other in a way that they don't if you're standing in the front, no matter how participatory or whatever you're trying to do. But just the sheer act, even if you're facing them, the sheer act of sitting in a chair rather than standing on your feet has some mystic mystical effect of making people more likely to talk to each other. And what do they talk to each other about? Well, in, in my class, we're usually in the midst of some, dis you know, we're discussing a topic. And usually I'll give them a topic, so let me help you out. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, so, what's the nature of authority? What's the, what's the nature of authority relationships? And of course, some people will walk out of the room. That's <laughs> because <laughs> they have authority. <laughs> Particularly silverbacks. No, what's interesting is the level of discomfort. Um, I'm, I'm sitting here saying, well, I shouldn't speak because I'm, I'm, I'm the other authority figure here, so I'm just sitting But you here. can't help it. But it can't help <laughs> it. Exactly. I don't know how to do this, but it's interesting. Exactly. It's I, so uncomfortable. Exactly. I, I want to share. And it's been less than a minute. Yeah. I want to share an anecdote about uh, discomfort with an authority situation. Uh, when I was in medical school, uh, everybody was required to take psychiatry, and part of the psychiatry was you had to go to somebody's private office for about four or six sessions. So we went to this office, and we came into his office, and there was a circle. I forgot if we sat on the floor in chairs, and there was a plate of cookies in the middle, and he was sitting there. The students all sat around, never said a word. We looked at each person like this. Just kept looking. So after a few minutes, nobody knew what the heck was going on. He was supposed to be the authority figure in charge. Nobody knew what was going on. Kept looking. So somebody must have spoken up at 
proposed leadership. They said, well, maybe we should introduce ourselves. So the students went around and introduced themselves, ate a couple of cookies, and thank God it ended. <laughs> 45 minutes later, we walked out saying, what the hell is going on there? Well, we'll probably find out next week. We'll have a, you know, talk about it. So, so girls, why are you addressing your comments? Yeah, about? I can't. Well, because well, I was precipitated by it's a good question. <laughs> by his um, reading on this. Anyway, so the second day we got in there, the second session, the same thing. He looked at each one of us, and went around, went around. Well, at this point, people were getting really annoyed. It was about 12 people. What are we doing here? What's his purpose? started talking about him in the third person, even though he was there and supposed to be the authority figure. And then a fascinating thing happened. We started to talk about how does it feel to be in a group when one person isn't speaking. And that, I don't know who brought it, so we started to have a discussion about what it means to be in a group when one person isn't speaking. And people shared their annoyances and things like that. And so then we left. Then we came back for a third time. <laughs> At least there were cookies. <laughs> and he persisted in just looking one to the other. And now more annoyance with that ensued, but there was more now of a discussion. And I mean, this is years ago. You can imagine the impact, since I still remember, um, about what it means to be in a group. I think we talked about authority. Who's the boss here anyway? Uh, are we getting anything out of this? We're not getting anything out of this. And then somebody would argue, we are getting something out of this. And then the last session, we came back and we thought, OK, now he's going to speak. <laughs> and um, we did the same thing. We had discussions. What did this mean? Did we learn anything? And at the very end, he looked at us and said something like, thank you. And that was it. There was no, but we ourselves had sort of processed what was going on. And we all left and said, this was one of the most amazing, weird experiences we've ever had. Um, and what it taught me about that, even though it was incredibly uncomfortable, you can't imagine, but we were forced to confront what's an authority figure, what does it mean to be in a group, who's going to talk in the group. And then once you started talking about who's silent and who's the authority, Nobody in the group could not speak, because if somebody wasn't speaking, they were that person. So it became a very interesting um, result exercise in group dynamics and authority and everything. That I, uh, and for us to wonder as students what that was about, and I think we got something out of it. And of all my medical school experiences, after all these years, that's when I remember. <laughs> Well, maybe I should say something as to why I had trouble <laughs> taking your thing, because it, it's sort of the opposite of what Rose was saying. So when I started teaching, I was a high school teacher uh, before I went to law school in, in a pretty rough neighborhood in, in the Philadelphia Public High School. Um, and this was in the 60s. So the, the choice was to be a regular high school teacher or to be a for want of a better word, a hippie high school, hippie <laughs> high school teacher. I didn't have a beard then, but I did have a mustache. Uh, and so I tried being in the hippie high school, which consisted of sort of coming in and saying, well, what do you think we ought to talk about? That was a disaster, absolute disaster. Uh, the, the power vacuum, I, don't, I, don't, I, I wouldn't even call it authority, this point of power vacuum was <clears throat> Total chaos immediately ensued. And the, I quickly learned that, the, at least in that setting, the most effective discipline was a class that kept things moving, where the teacher took control and made things happen that were sufficiently interested. That interesting that you got 80% people coming along with you voluntarily, and that put the other 20% in there in their place. Uh, so I, uh, <coughs> the, the, uh, the proposition that just a classroom where there is no set of power relationships 
I guess my instinctive reaction was, that's a bad idea. I mean, it, 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 obviously, this is a different context, so I may be wrong, but I'm just, that's where I was coming Well, there's a clear set of power relationships here. I mean, I am the person in authority right now. I'm just not a practicing authority the way you would expect me to. That's a good point. Well, I have a question for um, the people who are here and talking, and, and that is, what is it that we expected we would see or hear or experience coming to this particular session? Twice as old as I was, at least I thought so. 
Um, and um, they were telling me a lot of information, and I was more um, moving their, all their information together into groups to come to some things. There's different, different ways of authority. I appreciate that it's difficult to talk about how you feel about authority and authority relationships. Mm -hmm. We've all lived them our whole lives. We've never not been in an authority relationship in one context or another in the domain of our life at any moment in time. And that it would be easier to tell stories, yours or Rose's, and, um, but right here, right now, we're, we're in a complex set of authority relationships in which Judy felt compelled to speak for no reason other than she was sort of the chaperone for this party. And, and somehow that pulled her in. If any of you had been in her role, you probably would have felt compelled too. And why you felt compelled to tell a story, or Rose felt compelled to a story, or more experienced people in here so far have been doing all the talking, and all the people who, you know, who are used to keeping their head under the cover and making sure they stay out of trouble and you know, stay out of the authority figures off their radar screen are continuing to do a pretty good job of running for cover. <clears throat> authority relationships are pretty complicated for all of us. We have a lot of uh, accumulated scar tissue and complexity in relationship to authority relationships. We got one right here. Yours and mine. and yours with each other, the degree to which you're really authorizing each other to learn from, or simply to be distracted by momentarily to get this over with, <laughs> so you can get the cookies. <laughs> well, there's also the journalist recording this. So, yeah. <laughs> That's Not another question. journalist. I'm going to ask you. Well, I'd like to respond to uh, Lonnie's question. Um, because I also expected to see what was happening now, although I didn't know what form it would take. But I didn't expect it to be preceded by what seemed to me a long lecture. And it was, as lectures go, I thought it said excellent things about teaching. But it was, I had expected to come and experience your teaching. And maybe you do lecture as a teacher, but I felt it, I was greatly disappointed. to uh, propose a different analysis, which is that uh, Ronald doesn't really have authority because I think most of us see ourselves, at least I do, as equal to the other people who are in the room. I think it's been more politeness. You know, it's sort of, we are courteous. We assume somebody is speaking and they've been asked to speak that we are um, going to listen to them and defer, but I don't think that just because you're sitting there that you command 
and, and because you've been um, invited to speak, that you have quote unquote authority over us. So I just wanted to that up. I mean, if, if all of us agreed to do something, we would just do it. <coughs> but the teacher in, in the room is the person who, even, even just by physical setup, is the person who is nominated to make something happen. Or well, make right, but if they don't, for example, they sit down. But as he pointed out a few minutes ago, he's in fact making this happen. He's in fact what? In, in fact, making this happen. Right. He, he, he made it happen by sitting down. But he, 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 nobody else feels that they could step out and be. Right, but I, I think, so, so I agree with what you've just said, and I would just name it differently. So I think he has power, but not necessarily the far. I guess I would, it's interesting. I, when I think of authority, I would have uh, thought of it more as you have authority in a particular subject. You, know, you are an authority on teaching leadership, um, which is different from, say, an authority to lead this group. But there's authority by role, right? Yeah. You know, so teaching is a role. If we had come together two weeks ago, Eleanor, you know, if we were the same people in the room, Eleanor had the floor. Uh, so there's role, there's expertise, there's formal position outside of this room, that's what Ron was talking about before, you know, are we actually all mm -hmm. equal? Uh, I don't know. But it might be worth, I'm sure there are others. I guess I don't have to raise my hand, so. <laughs> <laughs> set some rules so it was actually easier for us to participate because we knew, for example, we could only speak once. So I thought that was, I think part of the vacuum here, to me at least, feels there are no ground rules, so it's taking longer to figure out what we ought to do. Um, whereas Eleanor's was much more comfortable, I think, in part because we knew what the rules were. You should pick 45 lines she could control. Yeah. And she told us, you know, I wanted to speak more than once, and she said, no, once. <laughs> For that rather. <round>. Yes. <laughs> but notice how easy it is in the absence of authority providing direction and giving you structure to lose your own sense of agency. I mean, I gave you a task, perfectly sensible task for anybody in the teaching profession to understand that nature of authority and how it could be practiced in different contexts differently and how to analyze it and what is the difference between authority and power and what does it mean anyway and what are sources of authority and you know but in the absence of my giving you a lot of structure how easy it is for people to forget what they're trying to do and here you are a case in point for what happens when people are really disoriented for a long state of time, the desperation for structure and order and somebody to emerge with conviction <clears throat> and know-how. But you might not see yourself on the slippery slope of what generates dictatorships much more commonly in times of crisis than in times of tranquility. Just another lemming looking for order. <laughs>
which I always say, that's the Harvard way, find what you have to look it up for yourself. Um, <laughs> and they look at me like, really? And like, oh, I don't know the answer, but I don't have to tell them that. Um, and, then, and then have to be really creative. So, uh, uh, or indeed have go down the slippery slope of um, maybe not dictatorship in my classroom, but indeed have mutiny among the class, uh, which I, I got all the way down there and they went to the Dean of Education and complained and you have tried that. I'm not gonna do that again, I'm sure. So, you know, but, but it, was interesting. it was an interesting experiment to see if I just really let it slide, how, at what point do they tip? Um, so I found it out. So it's, it's, it's true that there is, is, uh, is that balance. It's interesting too that we've avoided Eleanor's criticism of the authority. One question. <clears throat> I'd like to try to make it more of a question because um, one form of the question was how could this have been different <coughs> without the lecture that preceded it? I'm curious about that. And the other was whether the lecture was deliberately aimed at setting up what's happening now whether it had a specific impact on what's happening now, or whether it was something in a different, in a different box that had to be done. Just, just <coughs> I'm going to do that and then I'm going to do this. So I'm curious about those things. What impact might it have had? If you didn't show up. What's going on right now? I'm sorry? Just right, because you gave us a lecture, we have a, a framework for understanding what's going on right now. And we might be approaching this conversation differently if you hadn't given us the premise for how we run the classes and how we should be analyzing ourselves as a case study. How do you think it might have been different? <laughs> um, well, actually, I don't know if it would have been different because I had read the reading, which told us that this is a different class. Uh -huh. <clears throat> well, I think it would have been different if um, he hadn't shown up because we would have then had a conversation about what this um, series of seminars has meant to us or what we've learned thus far, do we want to go forward? I mean, I think if he hadn't shown up, I think we would have had a, a very uh, interesting, provocative conversation. I think the fact that Ronald did show up and then gave us the lecture is the point. And I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I think she's saying, what would have happened? The hypothesis wasn't that I hadn't shown up at all. It was that I had started straight off sitting down, you know, instead of beginning with a, oh, a long see. introductory lecture. You know, so what would what, what, what would have happened if, you know, I mean, how has this moment, how is it, how has our authority relationship changed because it was preceded by, <clears throat> not, and not only preceded, in fact, by my, you know, sort of um, many lectures preceded by readings. You know, by uh, an introduction. I mean, all of that had an impact on my authority in your eyes. I think you really going to have the meetings too. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be rather start cold. So I, I, don't, I don't mind you being annoyed. With you. <laughs> I can tell. I think if you'd come in and just sat down, that we would have thought you were not. Or what? <laughs> we would have thought you were not. Well, I'm not just doing the reading, and, and yet the, the lectures and the reading establish this is a person who's done a lot of thinking about education. And therefore, when he sits down, I would take that as a serious proposition rather than just as a, a nutty proposition. That's true. And actually, I thought by giving the lecture, first of all, that you established yourself as the authority on teaching leadership. So that's what happened, and then you sat down, and we we demonstrated that, that. I thought that was the focus. I mean, I, I thought that was the impact of what it had. I think we knew he was a authority on leadership. Work. Well, there's, but I, 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 I would experience. I'd like to have experienced it. Not, uh, yeah, I'm curious about this. Not just sitting down, but a, few, a couple of minutes after sitting down, you did pose one question. What is the nature of, I can't remember, authority, I think, the question is. So I think sitting down with the companies, then asking that question, and without the lecture, that's what I would like to know what it would be. Because we know he knows a lot about both teaching and authority and leadership. It's 
interesting because I see it from a very different point of view. I thought it as being very kind to us. Yes, um, absolutely. I did all, do all the readings, um, but I have a day job and an evening job and a night job appears. <laughs> um, and so just to summarize what I read um, and giving some people time to come in a little bit later, get settled, have a cup of coffee, um, you know, maybe gathering some courage for what I think we all thought was coming. Um, <laughs> I, I, thought it was, you know, I thought it was just really kind. And, and, and I thought it was respectful towards us and, and, and I thought and it gave, you gained respect in my eyes. So I thought it was wonderful. See if you can stay here. Just disrespectful. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is anyone else still feeling quite uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, it was an act of respect because I'm assuming <clears throat> that she is worth Richard listening to. So we didn't see down here yeah, what happened. So. Richard was just lost in his iPad. No, we were lost. I was checking the reading that you had referred to. <laughs> <laughs> I think what I've been most intrigued with is the at what point does Ron intervene or not? I mean, I'm struck by the contrast, Rose, with your story in which the leader instructor didn't intervene at all. And so, I mean, it's something that I think you think a lot about with case teaching. At what point do you get away from the student to student, and is the nature of the intervention simply to say, let's talk a little more about this, or can you elaborate, or, and so I've, uh, to some extent, for me, the last part of this discussion hasn't been as very interesting, whether you get done the intro or not, or the readings or not. I kind of feel like in the moment, when he decides to make a comment, and in a very, very subtle way, steer the discussion, a little bit, which is something you were desperate for and didn't get in those four weeks. So he's, to some extent, giving some of that. And and I think that's, I think, it, from a teaching perspective, I try to step back and think about the broader applicability of this. You know, how much do you give any structure at the beginning or not? Once things have started, whether you've given a structure or introduction or not, how early do you intervene? Do you intervene with a question? Do you intervene with an observation? And I think that's really good for me, what's been keeping my mind active during this discussion. You could also think that the entire half hour preamble was intentional to have two different illustrations of authority. So the event that you mentioned you're talking about right at the moment, you thought that was respectful, it just cranked you up. <laughs> you know, so two really different reactions to the half hour preamble, which I'm sure was not just lightly taken. You thought, how am I gonna start these people up? The ones who read the information and want to come in and start are going to be just driven nuts by having to listen to this. Others are going to say, oh, thank you for doing the foreplay. And you have two really different. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe we could, maybe we could um, stop and <laughs> take a few minutes to debrief this as a sort of a you know, laboratory experiments. And now, you know, we can stop the experiment and, and sort of debrief it. Um, because I, I want to, because uh, in, in, at least in my teaching experience, debriefing any experience is, ought to be, ought to be devoting, ought to be devoting, you know, at, at, at least equal time to the experience as to the debriefing, or, or one third at least of the same amount of time. So, and we don't have enough time to do that because I want to talk, I want you to talk about application um, to your own teaching. Does this have any, any kind of relevance at all? Um, but, uh, so we're going to do short shrift on the debriefing, but I want to make sure we get a chance to debrief. Step back on the balcony and say, okay, what just happened here? You know, and, um, and I think the frame I'd like to use for it is, Obviously, we're only together for you know uh, an hour and a half, a couple hours together at most. Um, uh, if this were the beginning of a two-day workshop or five-day course or a semester-long course, you know, um, and what 
we would have done is, um, is have nominated, what you have done to my mind is have nominated a series of really important uh, questions or theoretical ideas, you know, ideas that have theoretical relevance, relevance to theory. And I, um, and my, I would see my job as having tried to tease those out and make sure, not necessarily immediately in the debriefing, but over the course of the next weeks, that we would come back to these themes that have gotten nominated, um, uh, which, which my assumption is went by so fast that um, they didn't, or because you don't have the same theory to, you know, to organize it with, went by you. But my job is to not let it get by me so that I make sure we come back to these <coughs> open questions that began to emerge and, and, and begin to wrestle it down to the mat so they become conceptual lessons. I mean, the experience doesn't mean anything if it's not, if there isn't some conceptual lesson then um, brought to life through the experience. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and, and everything from my intervening with Richard to the, all the various kinds of interventions and, and, the, and then the themes that you've nominated independent of my actual provoking them or triggering them one way or another. So what are some of the themes? What are some of the questions you put on the table? Like if, if we really had the chance to wrestle to the mat, you know, these various questions about authority and what is power and, and how to behave and in what kind of context, you know, what kinds of questions were surfaced even in this half hour of doing this? I would say that something I started thinking about was when we talked about the nature of authority. It's true, we're not getting grades from you. We're not in any, you don't have control over our future in any real way. So it's re there's really sort of a social contract that has to do with respect, has to do with our all good, all of our sort of feeling of goodwill that we're going to learn something by being here. But I started to think, well, I guess that applies to a lot of different situations. So authority is a very relative thing, and it has to do with uh, one's, the good that one expects to come out of certain situations, but also uh, less in this case, but perceived consequences or bad things that might happen if it goes poorly. Those are things I started to think of as a, as a kind of a theme. Terrific, and, 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 and where that would take me, and where it does take me, is to say, okay, well, you know, imagine, imagine that here I am, okay, and here all of you are, and some set of institutional apparatus has given me some grant of formal authority to stand in front of you. And, and, and that there's a formal apparatus, you know, and it, there's, it's all of that stuff out there, you know, and represented by Judy and everybody Judy represents, and Suzanne, who's, you know, who's my associate academic dean, and, and everything she represents. And there's this whole formal apparatus that authorizes <coughs> me. But then I come and, st and, and stand in front of you. So one form of, one, so, I have some um, grant of formal authority. And all of you know when you stand in front of a class, you get a certain number of minutes where people give you the benefit of the doubt, you know, like it's shopping day. <laughs> and they give you the benefit of the doubt for a few minutes, and they'll say, okay, well look, the university might have, might have appointed you, your guild <laughs> might have appointed you, you know, the world might think you're great, you know, your mom might love you a lot. But we're going to decide whether or not to lend you respect, credibility, and then give you that one of the most precious sources of power that people can give, which is attention. And um, so the second critical source of my power is the informal authority that will, over time, fluctuate depending on whether or not I'm 
meeting or not meeting your expectations, whatever the criteria that you happen to be bringing to the party. I mean, imagine it's sort of like a hoop, you know, and I'm a, 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 a seal in the zoo, and I gotta jump through the hoop if I wanna get the fish. And you come in here, each of you with your set of expectations, Eleanor has hers, and somebody else has theirs, and to some degree those expectations overlap, but not completely. And if I were a really great politician, I would do a poll, and I'd figure out what's the, what, where, where can I make everybody happy enough to gain enough respect and credibility so that they're willing to give me authority. And I then squeeze myself into that space. If you're a politician or a teacher? <laughs> if I were a politician where my goal in a campaign was to get elected, which is that to gain, to gain the trust and respect that translates into authorization, and we'll define authority as You said politician on purpose though, right? Okay. Huh? You said you chose politician on purpose. Yes. Yes, because in a campaign, that generally is the task of a campaign. Campaigns aren't about leadership, they're about gaining authority. Um, but in teaching, you do need to gain a writ of authority, because otherwise students aren't going to pay any attention. And if you don't have their attention, if they're not willing to give you enough attention so that you can engage them in some sort of... So you have to have some informal authority. On the other hand, that's not your goal. Your goal is to teach them something. So Eleanor comes in with a set of expectations, or somebody else does, and I've got this terrible dilemma. On the one hand, I'm trying to, I need to gain your trust. On the other hand, my purposes may require me to go against the grain of what you expect me to do. To say, I'm not going to jump through your hoop, because actually jumping through your hoop is not going to be productive, given the material I want to teach you. So, uh, then I have to renegotiate the terms of the trust or the expectations. And anybody in organizational authority, anybody, and certainly anybody you know, in business or nonprofit or politics, and even in the classroom, is working that dilemma. Now, many times we're not working it consciously and deliberately and sort of analytically. <coughs> But then what is authority? Okay, so we can see that there's some formal authorization and some informal authorization. And I think it was, uh, was it Mark who's, who, who said, well, actually it's sort of a, I don't know, a relative thing, but I think what it really is trying to say is it's a relational thing. There's party A, there's party B, and, author, and authorization is, is something that happens between people. It's both relational and relative. What do you mean by relative? It's, there, there's no sense of absolute. There's, it's, it's something that is perceived, it's psychological, but it is seen against other forms of, of relationships, <coughs> other kinds of standards. Right, so if Lonnie walks in here with a whole history of relating to authority <coughs> word in a particular way, that would be relatively different than somebody else who has a whole different set of histories, loyalties, scar tissue, you know, levels of trust and distrust, wariness, <coughs> in relationship to authority. Yeah. Okay. So in my classroom, I want people to begin to learn about that because I want them to begin to understand when is how, what are the virtues of authority, what are the dangers of authority, how to be more conscious of what you're bringing to any authority relationship, either from the citizenship side, or employee side, or student side, where you're doing authorizing, or from the teacher boss side, where you're the authority figure. In both of those cases, you don't want to be on automatic pilot based on these huge complex histories that we have. You want to be trying to deploy your authority or negotiate with somebody in authority based on a particular problem, a particular collective challenge that you and a bunch of other people are facing, you know, in a particular moment in time. Maybe a learning challenge in the class or a, or, or 
you know, a public policy problem in public policy, or a business problem to a business, or a, or a, um, a, or a creative problem to a bunch of laboratory people. You don't want people just starting to fight because they're beginning to act out all their authority relationship history. Or to say, I'm not taking orders from you. Wait a second, maybe you should take orders from me. I mean, maybe that's actually the right thing to do right now. I mean, I'm about to drill a hole in your tooth, you know, and it would really be better if you just shut up right now. <laughs> so, so I, I feel like that's an, that's an important point, right? So, <laughs> so, I mean, it seems like we often think of authority as sort of relationship between people, but really what you're trying to do is you're trying to create some external standard to which you both aspire. And then you're not just kind of struggling for control. So in a classroom situation, I spend time observing classrooms. I see some teachers that try to map every moment, high school, moment of what their kids do, often unsuccessfully, because adolescents hate being told what to do. Uh, and then I see other classrooms where the teacher is hardly there at all, and the students are working pretty intently on their tasks. And I see people failing at that second approach, too. Uh, and, and I think what's happened is essentially students have certain expectations as to what should be happening in a class. The expectations are sort of to get deeper into the subject, very broadly speaking. And the teacher has sort of created the conditions through which the students realize that's happening. And then the sort of positional authority becomes less important. So what I found really disorienting about today was if you had said, you, you sat there before you gave us a task. And so then I didn't know what was going on or what rules we were playing by or what we were supposed to be doing. And then I felt a little better when you said, there's a topic, the nature of authority. Because I thought, okay, he's doing the, I'm going to sit back, but at least we're, we're working within a set of standards. Like we know what we're supposed to be trying to do and we know how to do that. We've been around a, a while. Um, and so then, the, but then the sort of lack of social order and the fact that none of us were really authorized to say, okay, this is how we're going to take on this question, let's split into groups, or let's talk about this part first, or so on, just made it really kind of difficult and uncomfortable. If you'd been more explicit, you know, talk amongst yourselves, would that have made it easier? In other words, so part of my discussion was, what's the goal here? You know, what, what am I trying to accomplish versus all right, here's a question, discuss. And, and then maybe we would have been a little bit less uncomfortable because we were given a task where what Ron did was more Lord of the I, I found myself thinking of Lord of the Flies. Okay, we've been put on the desert island. <laughs> and, and I found myself thinking, well, is, is there going to be that kind of pecking order? It, it was the, the, the sort of amorphousness of not being told this, the simple act of just saying discuss, I think would have at least made me feel a lot better because then I'd know what I was supposed to be doing. Whereas here we had to construct. But he did that, he sat down. He, he was telling you, I'm not gonna talk. If you, if, you, if you want to talk. But he didn't say it explicitly. It was, but he was communicating that. Well, but each of you did come here. I mean, in, in reality. <clears throat> You each came here not only for entertainment. You came here, you know, to see if there's something about teaching that might be interesting to you in your own experiments and efforts to try this or try that, and, you know, in your own teaching. And that's a real, that's a pretty concrete, you know, objective. And so, um, uh, but in the absence of structures that help you remind yourself of your agency. You know, that gets <coughs> forgotten. And, the, and a dependency gets generated. <laughs> and the dependency is really important, at least in, in the content of what I'm teaching. Now, I don't know how it's relevant to the materials you're teaching. You know, again, this is, this is designed for the we're teaching arts of practice in which, you know, questions of power, authority, and trust, credibility, and respect, and problem solving, and creative problem solving, and conflict, and world dynamics are relevant. You know, that's the content. So I'm just trying to make the content come to life. And one of the contents is dependency. 
What happens when people, when 9-11 hits, and the country and people are really disoriented, and all of a sudden people are upset that they can't see the face of their president until dinner time? when most people can get through the whole day without seeing the face of their president. <laughs> but not on 9-11, you know? And how do we understand that yearning for order in times of distress? And then how would we manage the disequilibrium that, that a lot of times very tough, challenging problem solving? I mean, if, if you're gonna do chemistry, you've gotta have a stomach for confusion that may last years. You know, and how do you stay in the game? And what structures will hold you? Well, you know, in, in, in organizations, how are you going to hold people to stay focused on a hard question when there isn't a ready-made solution? Without jumping to a ready-made solution, which sometimes can be very destructive, that ready-made solution. And that, so the dependency dynamic becomes a really important dynamic to investigate or the disappointing of people's expectations. How would you do that at a rate people can absorb without losing all your credibility? Or without pandering too much, you know, just to make them happy at the cost of, of getting any real problems addressed. Um, anyway, that's, that's the, so, I mean, I hope, again, we didn't get an adequate chance to debrief this, but I hope that at least you can begin to get a sense of how you've generated a lot of material. We could spend now, you know, several cl full classes just debriefing and then discussing how it's related to your own professional work. Um, a half hour experience. <clears throat> and, and how it connects into, you know, everybody's life. I mean, these are generic questions, authority relationships. And they, 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 <coughs> they go back generations in each of our, in each of our historical, fam familial, and ethnic, and gendered backgrounds. Something that seemed unusual to me in this room is you seem willing to sow discomfort. Mm -hmm. To sow discomfort, and it seems like, a, maybe that's part of the um, I want people conflict to thing, but the, you know, a lot of the hard problems like solving. That's the tool you use, and all of us are collegial, you know, we couldn't be more courteous to yes. each other. Yes. That's probably not like that in every room. <laughs> well, everybody is to begin with, but when I behave this way, disappointing people's expectations, and the disorientation begins to ensue, people get pretty tough with each other, and, and the civility begins to drop away, and, and people become a little more raw, um, particularly over time. And, and, and then the, some of the behaviors they exhibit, which I just touched on. I mean, I took just a little beginning of a clue from Wendy, and I extrapolated it all the way out, you know? But if you, when it plays out over more time, you begin to see, you know, and particularly if, if you have people coming from cultures where leadership equals authority, and authority is, you know, very traditional, and the absence of providing for that authority is abandonment and neglect, and you know, and usually what happens in my class is somebody does nominate somebody to take my place, and they try. But then within 10 minutes, they get killed off. <laughs> <laughs> they get killed off because they try to organize people like a traffic cop, with structure, not knowing that the only way to really organize people is around purpose. So the class, remains disoriented even though they have structure because structure sort of becomes a, a ready go-to solution but it's not really a solution, it's a temporizing. But I am trying to teach people to have a stomach for disequilibrium because creative problem solving, innovation, painful change, a lot of public policy, how do you get people to be better parents, or better citizens, or better teachers, you know, in a, um, uh, uh, or pay better tax. I mean, there's a lot of disequilibrium, or change their attitudes, their mindsets. Uh, a lot of uh, problems can't be solved expertly. They require changes in the hearts and minds of the of people out in the out in the business community, or out in the 
the society. So that means you've got to be able to backstop levels of disequilibrium and sort of control the pressure cooker so it doesn't get out of hand. But if you calm everything down, you know, a lot of real innovative and, and tough trade-offs won't, won't take place. Some other time I wanted to hear about some of the ones that get out of hand, but not so, quite. So <laughs> could we spend a little time talking about, I mean, it's about quarter or six, yeah, okay. about how this might or might not apply to other kinds Please, of yes. classes? Thank you. There's, I mean, I kept resisting talking about that the whole time because I know we're talking about authority and using this as a case study. And um, you know, there are several points of contact that I can think of for how this intersects with teaching. One is the um, notion of authority in teaching. I, I mean, a big question that I have about this is whether you could teach theoretical physics. I mean, this is a unique situation where the topic of what you're teaching is um, human behavior or an aspect of human behavior and so you can use um, the classroom as uh, a laboratory for people um, to engage in experiential learning. If you're talking about theoretical physics, does this sort of experiential learning work? Or if you're teaching high school students uh, and have classroom management issues, would this sort of thing work? So how, how much does this generalize to other settings and to other content is, I guess, the big question for me here. I think, I think there's a fair number of times where what I do in a classroom is to try to generate a discussion and then have a, I mean, I've never thought of it in the terms that you're speaking about today, but we're try to have then have a, a debrief or a meta discussion as to what were the Category that were formulating the free form, the apparently free form discussion that we were, were having, try to raise it up to a, try to raise it up to a more abstract or theoretical level, uh, and I think thinking about it in terms of, you know, let's look more specifically at the behavior that we had in the thing mm -hmm. might be a helpful way to think think about that. For me, one of the issues that come to mind is this notion of shared agreements. And how do we apply in our courses, either from the start or do they just evolve? So if we watch you in week one and then week four, week six, is there some evolving set of shared agreements or was it set up front, these are the rules, and then once we set them, we stay within those bounds? And it, it's interesting as we think about applying these, are we explicit about that or is it tacit and evolving over time? And I was thinking about it's not that you were teaching leadership, but how do we use the technique in our classrooms to achieve better learning by our students? And that that's what was making me feel, I, I was thinking, gee, if I were the student, and, and you're, po you know, you're me posing a question and nobody's answering the question, do I sit? Do I? How long do I wait before I, you know, jump in and help them with the answer and so forth? I was trying to experience it the way the students do, and I didn't feel like it was a great learning. You know, I, I felt like I, I, they need, we needed, and they need a bit more structure. If if the subject isn't what is leadership, what is a power vacuum, that sort of thing. If it's how do I get my students to really understand how to practice law, um, what's going to sort of draw them out? It reminds me once again of a question we explored a few weeks ago, which is, do students learn better when they're comfortable or uncomfortable? Um, so I, and I'm, I'm struggling with it, because I think there's certainly a role for us to step back and force our students to grapple with not only the material, but with each other, the context, the situation. Um, but, but I'm, I'm struggling with what's going on. I think, you know, I think we would need to figure out <clears throat> in different cases, like in the case you're just describing, what would be the lesson if you were to step back at, sort of at a meta level and you know, make a... And, and it would seem to me that, for example, you'd want somebody to learn about their ability to stay in the confusion show it, take responsibility for their own learning, even when it's not being given to them. Uh, maybe then come up with 
uh, the question to be asked if they were going to be researching it. You know, um, what would they need to know to work the question that you raised for which there's just empty silence? Um, uh, the fear of exposing I ignorance and being publicly embarrassed. I mean, these are all, you know, and I'm just making it up, but these are all seems to me to be relevant to the kind of, at least in a law, you know, the professional sorts of creativity, initiative, you know, not waiting for it to be structured, not, uh, okay, let me throw a question at you, I don't mind looking silly, you know, that's what, and so forth, yeah. set of, you know, where you get people to reflect on um, that so that you can move them along in their own, in their own yeah. professional development. And, and so the, I think you need to know then, okay, so um, otherwise I agree, just download the information, you know. Uh, my problem is sometimes downloading the information doesn't teach them some of the, yeah. the, the professional yeah. capacities that you want people mm -hmm. to develop to be more um, innovative or, or creative or yeah. frontier moving, you know. Yeah. There's a, a big debate that's been ongoing in educational psychology for decades about, you know, direct top-down instruction. I mean, lecture might be a bad example of that, but it's an example of it versus uh, discovery learning or less structured learning of the sort that we saw here. And I think um, people talk past each other, um, and it often boils down to the question of what are the le learning goals? Are the learning goals to teach some metacognitive ability to inform people about their interests, um, to motivate people in that case? Maybe there are benefits to less structured learning um, methods like this. Um, if the benefits are to transmit um, you know, some core concepts, maybe having that mini lecture at the beginning of class is better. But I think you highlighted there you know, the the learning goals as being really central to the method of instruction. So, what, what I took at least to apply to my own teaching, I teach quantitative courses on in your, not, not quite theoretical physics, but category, what, what really struck me was when you said um, that because students present their cases, you meet them at the frontier when they're ready to learn. And I've been reflecting about, um, you know, how I could do those this in my own classes because of, for me, it's like a right to learning goal is is this. But how how do you how do you meet them at the frontiers or where each of them is ready to learn? And I don't I, I, I mean this is a challenge, but it, it seems to me like that's the right way of thinking about it because they may be at different frontiers. And by having a very structured teaching environment, um, you know, you may try to guess what is the optimal average frontier that you're trying to delineate. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know how you do it. You teach statistics. Uh, it, it, you know, it could be that some of it needs to happen outside the classroom in some of the projects, or maybe it gives the students more freedom to choose what they work on rather than, you know, here's a very structured assignment. So we have a few more moments left and then we're going to turn this back to Judy, so any further? Judy's authority. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that people get motivated by purpose. So by what? By purpose. By they get oriented. Yeah, oriented. You, oh. you can orient people with an interpretation okay. rather than with structure. Okay, so um, in your teaching, you're using people's stories as the case studies. How do you consider doing um, a case in between where would you give them a task and assign someone as a leader and a couple as the followers and see how they perform as a group instead of using only their personal stories and critique them? In class? Yes, that, that would be terrific. I mean, that would be a simulation. In a sense. Yes. How do you, how do you and then you would debrief that, and there would be a lot to learn from that kind of a simulation exercise properly debriefed. But do you do? I, I don't do simulations um, because I find it more, a little more interesting um, to 
have life be real. So what we did was, it, you know, it, it wasn't a simulation in the sense that each of you had a particular role, but you did play yourselves, you know, and you can't help it. So then the lessons hopefully are more, more intriguing to you, you know, to be thinking about um, and then to bring back next week if we were to continue meeting, you know, as in class. So, but simulations are still very powerful if properly debriefed. I, my, I use this method because I think it's, because it's more real, I, my hypothesis is that it's more likely to generate lessons that will <coughs> apply in people's own lives. That they'll translate it into real behavior because it's not make-believe. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, wow, look what I did, you know. I didn't realize how much I wanted somebody to step up and create structure when all my life I've hated authority, you know, but here I am, you know. Uh, that's different uh, than, uh, but again, I, I, that's not to discount all these other teaching methods, formal case method and simulations. Those are various kinds of experiences. They're just more vicarious experiences. And, and I've been trying to make it less and less vicarious so that people are working off of their own, their own experience. So Ron, we want to thank you for time and your ideas and your teaching this afternoon. So thank, thank you, you very much. I appreciate the trust that you've given me. To <laughs> <laughs>
um, uh, from the process of this, there's two parts that I really have liked. One is hearing from people from different uh, disciplines, different schools, uh, even though I don't teach leadership, there are things I'm thinking about, what's my authority in the classroom, so I feel uh, very stimulated by the speakers. But the second part that I really, is very exciting for me, is after you do your presentation or the person, is just hearing from different people from different disciplines because the perspectives are really, you know, very diverse about how all people hearing the same thing relate to it and give back. And then that also, um, I think, uh, gets me thinking more. So I find this whole, the process itself, uh, very exciting and I'm really glad we're doing it because I haven't seen it here in years before. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of choosing the topics or other speakers from different schools, and uh, I, I would like to see it continue, and I took them to participate. Something interesting, I don't know if it is feasible, would be to participate in an actual class where the professor would teach. So we are on the balcony using your metaphor, and then have a session where we are in class. But I don't know how feasible that would be in every case. But it would be very interesting, because of your anticipation come here. I mean, I'm familiar with the literature and what you have written in your class, so I know that you have been here and there. Uh, it would be interesting you know, to see, you know, how, how would you convey your, uh, your methods and techniques and, uh, in, in, the, in a classroom, because this is a different kind of a classroom. Mm -hmm. what that, you know, maybe you're certainly welcome in the fall to come and observe my class anytime you want, you know, uh, be in the fall again. Tuesdays and Thursdays. I mean, you're welcome to send me a note, and I'll give you the sending the syllabus line on the schedule. But to actually, to actually have a scheduled opportunity to then debrief that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we could certainly have coffee. It's just one or two. Of <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of these sessions have kind of focused on uh, a method or a mode of experience, which is taken to be the kind of microcosm of the whole. I wonder if there are people who are good teachers, but it's the sort of the trajectory or something about how they think about getting their students from the beginning to the end that's really important. It would be hard to capture in this move. And I wonder if there's some way we could get access to that uh, in one of these sessions without like, following the class all semester. <laughs> See you at six o'clock. We will be emailing you, soliciting input. We want to thank all of you for coming and, and participating. Um, there, this is the kind of activity that I think Sam, I can speak to Cooper Hill uh, by saying that the purpose of the Hauser Grants is in part to facilitate the, this kind of inquiry. This happens to be a wonderful microcosm across the university. I think that's, that's one of the things that. Um, and we have lots of other ideas. I mean, at this note, we don't go into each other's classrooms. We might in, in certain schools, and it's usually evaluative. It's not, uh, uh, not part of sort of the eligibility process. So I think that there are opportunities for thinking. So send your ideas, and we will collate them. And uh, I think we will try to do this again in the fall. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.